Hello and welcome back to the AI Hardware Show with Sally Ward-Foxon and Ian Cutrus. Today we have a really exciting but very eclectic mix of AI chips for you, starting with Mobileye. So if we speak about autonomous driving, there are plenty of players to talk about. And Mobileye is one of the biggest. Mobileye, a division of Intel moving to IPO, uses a series of its own custom design chips built at TSMC to take in multiple inputs for autonomous driving and process them inside the car. The current lead chip for Mobileye is the IQ5, which is currently in production. I've sat in a couple of these IQ5 cars in a recent trip to Israel, where one chip, one car had one IQ5 for a level 2 plus autonomous driving and six IQ5s for level 4. It's a very machine learning driven workload. But an upcoming chip in mobilized uh, chain is the IQ Ultra. The idea is that with one IQ Ultra, you can replace six of these IQ5s to give you your level 4 autonomous driving. Now, the key thing about Ultra is that it will have multiple machine learning engines, traditional CPU cores for simple scalar mathematics, SIMD VLIW, that's a single instruction, multiple data, very long instruction word, more vector type processing. It also has CGRA, coarse grained reconfigurable architecture, which is more spatial and dense matrix engines. It's built on five nanometer and combined with 12 RISC-V cores. Altogether, we have 176 tops of int 8 compute or 4.2 teraflops of FP32. For having multiple engines, it can apply the right machine learning algorithm and network to the right core to give the right level of performance. One IQ Ultra is meant to consume about 100 watts as a typical design power, with sampling at the end of Q4 and volume in 2025. But one of the key things here is People who want this chip, especially the car developers who have long design life cycles, they can take just six IQ5s today and do all the work required such that the new IQ Ultra should be a simple drop-in. Next up, we have new chips. This Taiwanese startup is accelerating one of Hyperscaler's most common inference workloads, which is also one of the hardest to accelerate. How do they do it? Recommendation is the type of AI algorithm that powers social media news feeds, online shopping, and Netflix suggestions. Prediction accuracy is very important, as every loss percentage point corresponds to a dollar amount for the hyperscaler. Why is it so hard to accelerate? Recommendation models use these huge, sparse embedding tables, which contain all the many hundreds of features and maybe gigabytes in size. These tables are memory capacity bound, and lookups are memory bandwidth bound. Later stages of the algorithm are bound by communication and compute, so it's very hard to accelerate for general purpose accelerators. So New Chips has come up with a design for efficient recommendation inference, and they call the chip RecAxel. It has specifically designed engines to accelerate embeddings, matrix multiplication, and feature extraction. The company also has some tricks for allocating off-chip versus on-chip memory for embedding tables. Of course, they have their own FP8 number formats they've invented for inference. Uh, they call it FFP8 for flexible 8-bit floating point. The compiler actually selects one of about half a dozen different formats. This is part of how they quantize, but still keep prediction accuracy at the end. We don't have chips from new chips yet, but emulations suggest they'll be able to achieve a million recommendation inferences per joule of energy, or about 20 million inferences per second per 20 watt chip. It sounds like new chips needs new chips. <laughs> it's just <laughs> the first chip would be the great. The first chip. Yeah. First chip of new chips. <laughs> so in order to continue this eclectic episode, I'm going to talk about some optical compute from Light Matter with their new Mars accelerator. So this is essentially the first optical machine learning processor, at least we've seen, coming to the market. It uses optics in vector multiply accumulate formats. And the whole point about doing optical compute is that you can compute at the speed of light with near zero power. They achieve this using arrays of Max Zedner inferometers. A simple uh, function which takes in the light and using additional voltage, you can phase change that to be in phase or out of phase. And the idea is that consecutive in phases 
can provide that compute. You're essentially dealing with switches. Their Mars Photonic Matrix does 8,000 operations per cycle. Now, of course, in an optical accelerator, you don't have a cycle. But in this case, they're saying about 200 picoseconds. Those 8K ops is a 64 by 64 matrix with a 64 element vector, all computing at effectively int 8. But because light is essentially analog, you need analog to digital converters to get the data out. And it's usually the, uh, the capability of those analog digital converters that are the limiting factor in these designs. Now, you also need a source to get the light into the chip. So in this case, they use a 50 milliwatt laser that comes from off chip and, and is basically mounted inside. The whole photonics core is 150 square millimeters and is built on a 90 nanometer photonics process. Given that Global Foundries now has a 45 nanometer, that may change in future. But that whole 90 nanometer chip consumes about three watts for its compute and contains about 30 megabytes of SRAM cache. So while it won't support the largest models, it can support some. And yeah, it's relatively still in development. I would argue that this is more of a development chip than a production chip. But alongside that photonics core, it still needs a compute core, which it, uh, Light Matter calls its Mars core, built in 14 nanometer, and that is 50 millimeter squared. Alongside uh, this Mars processor, they also have their Passage optical interconnect designed for chip-to-chip -chip communication like a 2.5D interposer. I actually find that a bit more interesting than the AI stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. And now on today's video sponsor. A lot of the content on this channel wouldn't be possible without you, the supporters. Many thanks to all who support. And if you're interested in supporting, then we have Patreon, we have a merch store, I have a Substack newsletter, or simply just like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. Up next, we're going to tell you a little bit about the startup Rain Neuromorphics. Rain is doing exciting things with hardware and algorithms. The company's building a brain-inspired analog compute chip using RERAM as a compute element. Just like in other analog compute chips, there's an array of memorist developments, in this case RERAM. However, RAIN makes random connections between the elements in a way that's designed to mimic the sparse connections between neurons in the brain. These connections are physically implemented using 3D manufacturing techniques borrowed from the NAND flash process. Despite being very closely brain-inspired, RAIN isn't using spiking networks. The company has been working on algorithmic methods for training deep learning algorithms without using backpropagation, which is the algorithm widely used to train deep learning algorithms today, to make a way to train AI algorithms on analog chips. If we could apply analog compute to training, there is a ton of power to be saved and it can be much, much faster, opening up a lot of possibilities for training in edge devices like robots. The eventual aim would be robots that can learn by doing, just like how humans do. Rain has a demo chip with 10,000 neurons today, but is planning to scale up to 125 million parameters for workloads like natural language processing and recommendation, consuming less than 50 watts. So this is not an ultra low power chip, but something that will be used to do AI at reasonable scale. Samples are due in 2024. So if you've been watching the AI Hardware Show up until this point, you'll know that I've already spoken about IBM's AIU, their Artificial Intelligence Unit. Well, the same IP is inside their Z16 system or Telem processor. Now, if you've ever heard of Big Iron, well, IBM still makes them. Very important for the financial service industry or anyone that needs crazy uptime. In 2021, IBM announced its Telem processor, which sits in the heart of that Z16 mainframe offering. Telem is a general purpose processor for the Z architecture, which has eight of these chips connected inside a cabinet and 64 can be connected together for one full Z16 system. Again, this is what we traditionally call big iron, the big mainframes of decades previous that took up rooms and are used by the big companies for those crazy uptimes. Now it's down to a few cabinets inside the data center, but they're still very much needed for that crazy uptime. Inside each of these Telem processors, aside from the eight cores and the 256 megabytes of L2 cache, there is an onboard AI accelerator. Where the AIU has 32 cores, this is just one. But the core is custom to IBM. It's using their own IP, and it uses an on-chip network to help the cores inside run AI inference workloads, the biggest one being financial fraud detection. The idea is that a system that processes millions of transactions every second you need to detect if fraud is happening in real time. When you're at that cash point, nobody wants to wait 30 seconds at the terminal for a transaction to be verified. 
So if a company gets a full Z system, you're one of the few that still get access to one of those crazy 99.9999999 uh, 13 nines. I don't know how crazy <laughs> it is. Uptime systems uh, with now built-in AI. Want to know how you can cram in enough AI acceleration for active noise cancellation into an earbud? Here's how. Greenwave's technologies chip is called GAP9, but there are actually 10 RISC-V cores plus an AI accelerator in this design. The 10th core is used to control the cluster, managing tasks for the other nine. There's a shared L1 cache for the cluster, which is bigger than in the last generation and has more bandwidth. This chip soundly beat all challenges in a recent round of tiny ML benchmarks on both latency and energy. GAP9 can do up to 50 giga ops at 50 milliwatts, but can run small workloads down into the microwatts with ultra-fast latency. It can sit next to a camera in an IoT device where it can do things like person detection, but it has special features for audio processing, specifically for battery-powered devices like hearables. There's also an on-chip sound filtering unit to handle ultra-low latency audio stream processing and low-power filtering. The chip is 3.7 by 3.7 millimeters, so it can fit into the tiniest of form factors. It's powerful enough to handle advanced noise cancellation, which has strict latency requirements. AI, in this case, is used to detect the kind of audio environment the user is in, and the noise filters can be adjusted according to that. One of Greenwave's partners demoed GAP9 doing AI-based active noise cancellation in 1.5 milliwatts per channel. It also suits applications like voice pickup and spatial audio. So I think the key key aspect there is, can I get my noise buds to actually last more than three hours? I think you can. Now you can. So I actually have one of those uh, sports ones that last for 10. Maybe if it lasted for 30, might be better. <laughs> that would be awesome, wouldn't yeah. it? So in this episode, we've, we've covered a lot. As we said at the beginning, it's been an eclectic mix from optical uh, to pseudo-neuromorphic to IoT. No spiking this time. No spiking this time. You have to go back to the previous episode for Recommendation that. is pretty cool. Re recommendation, I think, needs a lot more attention paid to it. it it's can... a huge workload and there's a huge opportunity there, I think. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. You want to hear more about that? Then head on over to the After Show podcast. Links in the description below. If you're watching us not as this video goes live and you're binging it, then check out the playlist for the next episode. Thanks, Ali. Thank you.